Today, we're discussing how to simplify and de-stress your life with regards to diet, exercise, mental health, and alcohol. Welcome, everyone. Before we start, remember to subscribe and click the bell. And if you want to be on a panel, click the link in the description below. In this day and age, we all need to learn how to de-stress and simplify our lives. We have a super smart and helpful panel with us today. Lynn Epstein is the author of Don't Get Too Excited, It's Just About a Pair of Shoes and Other Laments from My Life, where she discusses how to handle OCD with humor. Jen is also an activist, has an MA in media studies, and works by day in television. Lisa Boucher is the award-winning, best-selling author of Raising the Bottom, Making Mindful Choices in a Drinking Culture. For the past 20 years, she has worked with hundreds of women to overcome alcoholism, live better lives, and become better parents. Karen Asp is the award-winning journalist and author of Anti-Aging Hacks, 200 Plus Ways to Feel and Look Younger. She's also a vegan, fitness pro, pianist, animal shelter volunteer, traveler, and Nordic walking world record holder. Oh, wow. Sharita <laughs> Cole Brown is the award-winning author of Defying the Verdict, My Bipolar Life. She has a master's degree in teaching and a fulfilling career in education. So one of the focuses of the panel is setting ourselves up for success by how we create and shape the environment around us, both external and internal. So let's get started. So how can we simplify our lives? Can you give us your top two tips? So I'm going to be addressing how to simplify your relationship to diet and exercise. And my two top strategies, I'll address exercise or movement first and my strategy is move for one to five minutes every 30 minutes especially every 30 minutes that you sit if that's a little too much to ask every 60 minutes I want you to do structured exercise but we know that Americans sit too much and too much sedentary time is killing us so if we can just break that sedentary time move a little bit more it will actually also help increase your fitness levels at the same time. My second tip relating to diet is to move toward a plant-only diet. And we know that that is really the path to optimal health. I know it's challenging because most Americans are eating a lot of animal products and not many fruits and vegetables. In fact, a study recently found that the low intake of fruits and vegetables is actually a major risk factor or factor in heart disease deaths being on the rise. So my tip for getting more fruits and vegetables in is to divide your plate in half and half of that plate should be filled with fruits and vegetables. And this is not just at your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but if you eat snacks, make half of that snack fruits and vegetables. Mm. All right. So I will just say simplify your life with the drinking and ask yourself if maybe it's time to rethink the drink that every time you want to go for a cocktail maybe ask yourself do i really need this right now is it going to make my life better now is it going to make me feel better maybe it will in the first 30 seconds but try to play the take forward and see what you've got going down the road i know or a lot of people, they have a cocktail, and then that leads to two and three and four, and they really don't accomplish much of anything. And this contributes to stress because then you're running around the next day trying to get all these things in that you didn't do the night before. So the drinking ends up adding a lot of stress. People use it as a way to cope and as a way to de-stress, but really it can add a lot of stress to your life because most people are drinking to change the way they feel. So we have to not want to run from our feelings. So try to sit with it, pause for maybe 10 seconds and ask yourself, am I hungry? Am I tired? Am I angry? Am I lonely? What am I feeling and what can I do to address that feeling that is constructive as opposed to destructive? And Lisa, I'd also like to ask you, um, a lot of drinking is a social situation. How can people simplify their handling of alcohol in social situations so that they can get more control over it perhaps if they want to? Well, I think we have to get comfortable with saying no thank you and moving on. As adults, we shouldn't have to feel 
badly about saying no to a cocktail. And I'm getting so many people reach out to me and say that it is so awkward for them in social situations to say no, because other adults won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And we have to start pushing back on this. So Lisa, it sounds like what you're talking about is establishing boundaries, that is boundaries in your own life regarding um, the, the role of alcohol and also boundaries with others as to what you will and won't accept when you go out with them, that right, boundaries right. can simplify the relationship. And Karen, I wanted to bring it back to you because yeah. I know that we all would like to move more, but somehow when we're sitting down, it's so <laughs> watching Netflix on a binge, it's, it's oh. hard to get up. <laughs> so how do we get up literally every half hour? For example, if we have a desk job, how do we make that happen like practically? Okay, well, practically, I think, first of all, I would recommend setting a timer. Whether you have a timer on your laptop, your computer, a device, a smartwatch, whatever it might be, your tracker, set a timer, whether it's 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and get up. I also say drink more water. And the reason I say that is because, first of all, it's great for fluid intake, and we know that people need to get more hydration in them, Americans in particular. But by drinking more, you're going to have to go to the bathroom a little bit more. to get up. Which means that you have to get up. And regarding the um, eating more fruits and vegetables, yeah. you and I were discussing um, in your interview how to set ourselves up for success insofar as having the, the fruits and vegetables prepped and sitting yes. on the counters for us, not just waiting until we're hungry. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. So I think that you started off, Melissa, talking about changing your environment. And really, when you talk about any kind of habit change, you definitely want to change the environment in some way. So for instance, if you're eating a lot of health, unhealthy, junky cookies and chips and things like that, and fruits and vegetables are basically nowhere in your fridge or they're very at the very bottom and they're getting wasted and you're pitching them half the time, which is what usually happens to these great fruits and vegetables. You need to change the environment so that the first thing that you see when you open up the refrigerator would be your cut up fruits and veggies. They should be at eye level on your shelf. All of the other unhealthy stuff, get it out of, or yeah, get it out of your house, but work to eliminate it and then don't bring it in your house. And then have a bowl of oranges or bananas, apples, whatever you prefer, sitting front and center on your kitchen counter in the middle of your table, you'll be more likely to say, I'm going to eat that apple versus I'm going to eat those cookies. And the other thing too is if you do have the unhealthy food, hide them, put them way up in your pantry where you have to get on a chair to get them, throw them in the back of a closet so that you have to dig a few things out to get them. <laughs> and studies show that when it's right in front of you, you have a higher likelihood of eating it. Right. And also pre-cutting it up, putting it oh. in snackable portions, and then also literally taking that and putting it on your desk. Well, Melissa, that's why I say when, whenever you shift to, let's say, a plant-only diet, one of the first things that people say is, oh, it takes a lot of time to prep. It takes a lot of time, everything. Yeah. I mean, being healthy takes time. It's an investment in your future though. And I always say, I'm like, take a day, whether, whatever day that is. For me, it's Sunday. Get all your fruits and veggies and chop them all up. Make your grains, make your beans, put them in containers in the fridge, and then you have them for the whole week so that when your week gets busy and let's say it's a Wednesday night or Thursday night and you have no time to cook a full meal, but you have time to like grab from the fridge and put some rice, warm that up, put some beans on top of it, throw a bunch of all the cut up vegetables that you've got. Absolutely. Prep is key in this, in this battle. Hey, then I'm, I'm the one on the panel who uses self-deprecating humor to, um, deal about, talk about how they deal with navigate crisis situations. Um, I think it's best practices are to know your limits. Um, you know, let's say that you um, have a big week at work happening um, where you're doing a big uh, a PowerPoint presentation for your, for your boss, then, you know, you might want to ask if you also have a lot of family expectations, then you might want to ask your um, your, your, um, your spouse or your partner to drop off the kids at school. And if you are, you know, doing a, a reading <laughs> for your book, then you might not want to post that extra blog on your, write up that extra blog on your website. Um, just to know your limits before you get into a situation that, um, 
is, is going to cause undue stress. Can you tell us what it's like to, to deal with OCD? What are the challenges and how does simplifying your life help with those challenges? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's always a challenge. I mean, beyond knowing your limits, it's to just kind of to, to prioritize, to figure out what, um, what at the end of the day is, is, um, the most important task at hand, like which, um, choosing which tasks are, are, are the priority and putting, pushing everything else to the side. Um, and it'll be there again the next day or the day after that or the following week. So I think that sometimes perfectionism can be a form of OCD. And I don't know if you all have heard the phrase, uh, perfection is the enemy of the good, which yeah. means that when we have expectations of perfection, we overwhelm ourselves and end up not doing anything at all. So if we rather just allow ourselves to do something, and if it's not perfect, then it's, it's still something. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Um, uh, per per perfectionism is the beast, absolutely. And um, you just, uh, you, you don't want to get yourself into that situation. And for me, um, I will be addressing how to simplify your relationship with mental health challenges. For me, there are, my two tips would be to take care of yourself, to have a real regimen of self-care, because mm -hmm. if you have mental health challenges, you don't have to be mentally ill, but if you have mental health challenges, and my book is Defying the Verdict, My Bipolar Life, where I talk about um, what I have done to live in bipolar recovery for more than 25 years, and I have a severe case of bipolar disorder. So I have to take care of myself. I have to take care of my physical being. And then the other thing for me is to identify the things that trigger me so that I can live peacefully. Yeah, I would I would bounce off of that. That um, is is to figure out what what's going to trigger you. Um, you know, for me, my one of my big t t triggers is a is a fear of contamination. Um, mm -hmm. So there are certain <laughs> certain things that I that I just that I don't do, um, uh, like getting manicures. Um, uh, I, I just, I would just, I just do it at home. Um, or I bring my own, um, utensils <laughs> or implements with me. Um, because I know that that's something that is going to cause undue stress. Well, and I, I'll jump in too, Tarita. I think what you said about self-care is so crucial. We know that self-care is, is, you can't have good mental well-being, mental emotional well-being without taking care of yourself. And if you're caring for others, especially in your life, your kids, your husband, your uh, wife, partner, whomever it might be, if you're not caring for yourself, you won't be able to care for those individuals as well. And for all, everybody, even if you don't have, as you mentioned, a mental health illness, self-care, whether it comes in the form of exercise or meditation or journaling or being with your, your kids or spending time with some animals, volunteering, whatever it may be, reading a book, that's all self-care and that goes such a long way. Sharita, I know you and I were discussing how in the morning you have a, a ritual of almost, uh, you said you fill yourself with peace. Can you tell us about that? Yes. How you yes. start off your day is very important. When I start off my day, I spend about an hour getting ready, just centering my mind. Um, I meditate, I pray, I sing, I read um, scripture in the morning. I'm a Christian, I read scripture in the morning. And what I, it's all about in the morning, centering my mind to be ready for the day. Because for me, a big trigger for me is stress. So it's important that I start my day well so that I can 
continue the day well. I love that. So we have to manage the stress in our life in a healthy way. And sometimes I think that the healthiest thing we can do is set boundaries and say, no, we don't have to yes. take on everything. So that segues nicely into the next question, which is, um, how can we de-stress our lives? Like Karen was saying, get out there. And nature's been a huge tool for me. And, and walking or exercise, all of those things to get that mindfulness flowing that I'm looking around. And nature's just been very calming for me. And um, I'm not a jogger, but I do enjoy walking in nature, hiking, those kinds of things. Lisa, what would you recommend to people who live in a big city? Just... Well, I would say search out some green space. For me, I couldn't live with surrounded by glass and concrete and steel. That I don't I don't feel as peaceful in a city. And I know I would say if you live in a city, there's got to be some green space. So scope out a park bench or a beautiful tree that they say the trees give off chemicals. It's called phytocines and they will help decrease depression, increase your immune system. So I know hugging really does work then. Right. So <laughs> finding exactly a tree. tree hugging, find a tree and hug it. It's really, really true. So that's what I would suggest if, you, if you're in a city. And, you know, we can bring the outdoors in. And I have done that. I mean, I have a lot of natural wood, stone in my house that grounds me. I have things on my desk like stones and bird feathers that I found and things like that. I love being surrounded by nature. So that's a way for me to take care of myself. I know that that works for me and I like that and that speaks to my soul. So I think we all have something maybe for other people if you're in a city, get a goldfish. You know, they say that lowers <laughs> pressure to watch a fish swim around in the water to look at aquariums. So there's all sorts of little things we can do to bring the outdoors in, to bring those calming, like Sharita was saying, those calming influences into our home or the space, regardless of where you live. Yeah, Lisa, I live, I live in a big city in a 650 square foot apartment. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, but, I, but I do have a backyard deck. Um, yeah, I like to sit outside for, for um, you know, 15, 20 minutes in the morning and do some deep breathing and just listen to the birds thrumming in the trees. And, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a school um, next to me where I just listen to the kids running around and um, it is really calming and soothing. Um, so I wholeheartedly agree with you that um, that getting outside, um, having a little bit of nature bathing, as they call it, is right. Right, Shinrin Yoku. It's called. It's it's forest bathing. Shinrin Yoku. It's a Japanese word. And I did read of a study where eighty nine percent of adults spend fifteen minutes or less outdoors. outside. Yeah. 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 So that's a problem because we're not meant, I don't think, to live in structures all that time. We are meant to commune with nature and to get out. And I mean, if you want to, I don't know what your beliefs are, but even if you go back, if you believe in evolution, hunters, gatherers out there picking stones, I mean, we are meant to be like, like Kim was saying, moving upright and working, moving our muscles and engaging with the animal and the the plant world around us. And Lisa, as you were saying, we get natural vitamin D from the sun. So when there are times when I can just sit out on my porch, I like to just sit out on the porch and absorb the sun's rays. Yeah. Right. So that, it just makes me feel better mm -hmm. to be out in the sun. When I am with my parents, which is a lot, I can go sit in their yard and you know, as Jen was saying, listen to the birds, see the trees. And I actually, have, my little niece has bubbles in my parents' house. Yeah. Sometimes I will just go outside yeah. and blow the bubbles in the bubble wands. And when I do that, it's relaxing. I feel like I'm on the Lawrence Welk show, if anybody yeah. is old enough to remember that, with the bubble <laughs> machine. Right. And it... 
I just sort of a little bit and it helps me to calm down. <laughs> it really sounds like you're all talking about getting back to basics. For example, when uh, pilots are in trouble in the cockpit and there's an emergency, they often forget to do the most basic thing of flying the plane. And we're talking about breathing, eating right, going outside, just giving our body basically what we need. So I think that's simplification and getting back to basics all ties into each other. I mean, exercise is, is for de um, de-stressing my life has been absolutely key. Uh, it's actually one of the chapters that I talk about in my book was starting to work with a personal trainer um, in spite of the financial hardship that it caused. Um, it's, it, it came at it. I started working with the trainer at the time when I wasn't just dealing with obsessive behaviors and anxiety. Um, I was also dealing with uh, a, an, a, the beginnings of a chronic health condition. Um, and I just, and in, 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 since I use humor, I am glib about that. I, that I, my, my preconceptions of, of, of people who work out with trainers would have to be people would live in estates <laughs> in estates with well, well manicured lawns and thoroughbred thoroughbreds in the stables named Thund <laughs> Thunderclap. But, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, I, um, I, I found out that I was wrong and that it has really been an absolute saving grace for me. Um, I work out, uh, for an for an hour twice a week, um, and I've been doing that now for uh, about three years, um, and it's just I mean that would be the one situation where I would say to not know your limits to push beyond your limits unless right. it's unless it's physically too much exertion and it's going to cause you know problem. But um, I I've I've really learned to get outside of my comfort zone. It mm -hmm. really helps with. Um, with focus, um, it really helps with um, with building endorphins, which helps with the depression. Um, and it's just been, and um, I, I I don't know what I would do without it. <laughs> so, so the last question is: if you can give us some emergency tips. For example, if life has thrown us a curveball and despite our best efforts, we're reaching for the chocolate or the alcohol or just not coping our best, what are some practical things we can do to stick to our healthy habits? Well, I think you said it, is you have to make it a habit so that when a crisis does hit, that's your default button because we're going to go back to our most comfortable behavior. So if it's a brand new habit that you're trying to create and then a crisis hits, you're probably not going to handle it well, or you're going to go back to your comfort, whether that be food or alcohol or relationships or whatever by shopping. Some people, retail therapy is their therapy and they just go out and spend a bunch of money and it takes their mind off of whatever crisis or what's going on. So I think the key is to these little things and some of the tips, what we've been saying all along, the basics, the eating right, the exercise nature. If you make these a part of your life, then when crisis hits, you're going to do something healthy. You're going to take a walk. You're going to pick up the phone maybe and cry to a friend as opposed to go open a bottle of wine and drink the whole thing to just you know, check out of the thing. And that's what happens a lot is people drink just to check out and whatever you're checking away from is there the next day. So if you can do it in moderation, obviously there's nothing wrong with it. But when you're using it as a coping skill, when it's your go-to way to feel better all of those things, you're in the danger zone. And right, I think that's an important differentiation is between those who have a drink like maybe once every two weeks. Exactly. There's versus somebody wrong. who's using it as right. a life tool that right. indicates a crutch that they should fill with another healthy habit. Right. It, it, when it's your coping skill, it's a problem. Yeah. And some people don't even realize that. So I would suggest to really be mindful when you are drinking. Is it purely just to have a little bit of conviviality with someone else and everyone's having a cocktail 
Or are you needing that cocktail before you can walk into a party or a room full of strangers because you don't feel okay in your own skin? Are you using that alcohol because you don't know how to talk appropriately to your spouse or your partner? Um, so you have to really be mindful. And then the, the, the one thing that's life-changing, I know it was for me, this is life-changing and it's so simple, but it's the hardest thing. And that is to be honest with yourself. Anything that you're doing addictively is probably mm -hmm. not healthy. Well, I was going to say, to, to add on to what Lisa was just saying, I think agree with all. And I think forgiving yourself, too. Now, I'm not, you know, if you've, let's say, reached for that chocolate that you put away in the back of your cabinet <laughs> and your chips and all that stuff, and you've gone on a binge, maybe you have the Ben and Jerry's non-dairy uh, ice cream, and you've eaten that whole pint we're all human and we're all going to make mistakes and we're all going to fall away from our intentions. But I think that if you can acknowledge that, as Lisa kind of said, be aware of it, forgive yourself. This is not the end all be all. It doesn't mean that you can't go back to your healthy intentions that you had before you slipped up. Okay. Be aware, recognize it. Now write yourself again. The other thing I always like to say, um, there's a question that I love to ask, and this is really what I still do, even though I follow a very clean, healthy lifestyle, et cetera, uh -huh. but I still those moments. I always say to myself, how will this benefit my future self? Wow. That's it. That's I like that. Yeah. yeah, right? There was something that I had wanted to say in this section about emergency tips. For me, because I have a chronic mental illness, I have a wellness recovery plan. And it's something that you create for yourself while you are well, so that if you are starting to feel ill, there are steps in place for what you will do and what, I have accountability partners, what your accountability partners will do. I have a sister and I like to say that she's like an app. She can hear, changes in tone in my voice because if you're getting manic or getting depressed your voice actually does change and it, i don't know if they've completed the app but they're working on something at the heinz c prechter bipolar research institute in michigan where what they're looking at is being able to put something on people's phones like you have an accountability person and they attach that they would attach like let's say that it would attach my app to Lisa's phone so that when Lisa and I talk, that she'd be able to hear if my voice was going too much or too fast or if it was going down or too slow. And then she could help me with the next steps because I would have a whole plan that she would be aware of. That would be great for me wow. since one of my, my compulsions is to check, um, to check doors, to, to, to check light switches, to check the stove, even though I don't use the stove. Um, so if, an, an app would be great to just tell me to stop. <laughs> for my, my emergency tip is I, I have a mantra that I use mm -hmm. that, um, uh, even if something seems incredibly insurmountable that day, that with, and it, it may seem a little schmaltzy, but with each passing day, things get a little bit better and it, it starts to not feel so insurmountable with, with each passing day. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, one of my, my emergency tips is to reward yourself, um, whether that's binge watching uh, your favorite TV show or getting outside uh, on the deck, um, and um, but my what my book focuses on is humor, and I I really believe that the best tip is to laugh whenever you can, um, as long as it's an appropriate situation. But <laughs> I leave that to your discretion. Um, but I just really believe that humor is healing. So laugh whenever you can. And for me, I have one other thing. Because I have bipolar one disorder, um, people who have bipolar one disorder statistically are more likely than anybody else in this country to actually die by suicide. 
And one of the things I tell people as a mental wellness advocate, I am on the National Alliance of Mental Illness, NAMI Maryland Board of Directors. One of the things that I tell people is that just to remember that you have survived all of your worst days thus far. Yeah. And that's something that can encourage you. If you just think about that, every worst day, no matter how bad it has been, you're still here. And so, you know, we need to encourage one another to be still here. Because for me, I have an illness where it was expected that I would end up needing a custodian. And as I said, I am blessed to take care of my parents. But I am very intentional about what I do for myself. And I'm very intentional about teaching other people to be well. It's like, Lisa, I'm listening to you. Karen, I'm listening to you. Jen, I know you well. And all of you are doing things to make sure that you can stay healthy. And I applaud that because that's, that's what we need to do. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today, everybody. To all our viewers, don't forget to subscribe. And all the panelists' books are available on Amazon. Links are in the description below the video. Please links to their websites, jenepsteinauthor.com, sharitacolbrown.com, raisingthebottom.com, and karenasp.com. Thank you for being with us and wishing everyone lots of health and happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>